My name is Jeffrey Sidoris, and this is not a typical episode of, well, anything really. It's more of an audio sketch or a journal entry. It's very raw and entirely unfinished, but despite those things, I feel like it's important to share because it's part of the framework of something bigger, potentially much bigger. One of my favorite photo documentaries is Darkness and Light, which is a fantastic look into the mind and work of Richard Avedon. Now, a lot of people know Avedon from his photographs in the American West. Bold, monochrome portraits set against stark white backgrounds. Or that poster. You know the one. It features a nude Nastasia Kinski lying on a concrete floor entangled with a massive Burmese python. Originally shot for Vogue, the poster went on to sell millions of copies. Avedon's career spanned six decades, and his work bridged the gap between art and commerce in a way that few others managed to do, either before or since. And yet he still felt dissatisfied with all that he had accomplished as a photographer. Quote, I've never been able to put all I know into a photograph, he said. A photograph can be an adjective, a phrase. It can even be a sentence or a paragraph, but it can never be a chapter. So it's been a lifetime of frustration in terms of expressing myself because of the limitations of the visual image. I believe in it, but it's limited. End quote. Avedon has been at or near the top of my list of favorite photographers for the better part of three decades. But honestly, it's still hard for me to articulate why I feel such a connection to his work. There's an obvious technical mastery of the medium, but I could say the same for dozens of photographers whose work doesn't hold my interest in the same way or resonate as deeply as that of Avedon. So what is it that makes his work so compelling to me? Does he deserve the accolades, and if so, why? I was talking to my friend Hugh Tallman and happened to have my little Zoom H2 with me and asked if we could hit the record button, since the odds are pretty good that at least one amazing story will emerge whenever I talk to him. Hugh recently retired from a 33-year tenure at the Smithsonian Museum of American History first as a darkroom tech, then as a photographer. Before that, he spent 12 years at the National Archives where he printed many of Matthew Brady's glass plates from the Civil War, as well as the work Timothy O'Sullivan did as part of the Western Survey. His knowledge and experience in all things photographic is staggering, and if anyone could answer the question, it would be him. Here's a slightly edited version of the conversation that followed. If I go by the visuals, if I just go by the visuals, yeah. you know, having shot 8x10, I'm amazed because 8x10 is a beast. I mean, you know, just setting the camera up is intimidating. And to move from roll film to an 8x10, and yet when you look at those pictures, there's this same kind of casualness and and kind of energy and kind of... It's almost spontaneous, not totally spontaneous, because, of course, you know, it's it's some in some cases it's lit. But it's amazing because, I mean, that, the, you know, at least the tendency for me, if I'm given a view camera, is you get tight. I mean, and I'm, I'm sure there are people who can shoot this way. But I mean, Avedon was really, you know, there he has the assistants lined up with the holders because that's the only way you could do it. You couldn't do it by yourself because you'd be, you know, you know, picking up a holder and that would be a break in the flow. So and is he just off to the side sort of directing and having I don't know for sure. I don't have any personal, you know, I have no personal interactions with Avedon, you know, and only, you know, I'm one of the people who's just like, oh, Richard Avedon, you know, I'm one of those people. Yeah. So when you look at his work... That mystique is it. It holds. It's it's there for you. Well, it holds, but I mean, I'm impressed. I mean, you know, I'm I'm really impressed with the kind of energy that I see across the board. You know, across the formats, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. You know that there's the same kind of energy shooting with a Roloflex. There's the same kind of energy shooting with a Hasselblad. There's the same kind of energy shooting with a 35. And that's a that's a phenomenal. I mean that you know that is a phenomenal um, achievement right there, because they're all different. You know, each one of those cameras has its own thing to it. 
So to and, get something cohesive across and to get those. to get something cohesive yeah. again across all those different formats and even all those different settings, you know, to to get that kind of spontaneity in a studio setting and then be able to go out on the street and get the same kind of, you know, composition and and you know design. I mean that that's that's no small thing. I, I feel like there's a consistency from the beginning of his career to the end of his career that that doesn't feel forced. Yeah. Like he 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 never he knew who he was from the beginning and he just kept refining it. Whereas a lot of photographers have to really try and go in in vastly different directions to try and find who they happen to be or yeah. what they're trying to say at any yeah. point in their career. And I think that's for me that's one of the beauties of Avedon is is it's it's sort of like Picasso. You can you can pick anything out of it and and sort of move it ten or fifteen years down the timeline and put it back in and it still fits. Yeah. It's it's still you you don't go, oh that that doesn't work. At least to me. Uh-huh. uh-huh. I don't know. Yeah. Well I mean it was you know, as I say, it was a real eye opener just to spend, you know, a few a few hours there, you know, in the studio. And I, one of the things that was really cool was to see the uh there's a diagram of, of one portrait with all the burning in oh, instructions wow. and stuff. Wow. And it's like, I get it. That's cool. You know, cause I used to do that. I did that in my head. Yeah. You know, I'd go, okay, I want this area down 10%, you know, and so on and so forth. And would he you dictate know? that or was that done by, a, did he have a darkroom tech that, that would well, it looks like things? he dictated. In other words, they would bring out a print. And then he would diagram. He would mark it up. He would mark it up. He would di- he would diagram out. You know, this area I want down. This area I want up. Is there anybody? I mean, do you feel the same way about like pen or are there are there? I actually people? like pen better. Okay, why? Uh, pen is a, seems to be a little warmer, a little more human. I, I don't know. It's a kind of an indefinable thing, but there's there's something about pen. And I mean, anybody who can make art out of frozen food, I mean, please. <laughs> that was a fun show. Yeah, that was, was. That was a great was show. Really, I've never seen any of his color uh, still life work until that show. I'd seen uh-huh. his color like the fashion stuff. Right. But I had never seen any of, of the frozen foods or... Yeah, no. And, and you're right. To make frozen pizza... To make frozen food. Yeah. Like Weston making, you know, bell peppers look sexy. Right. Like, really? Right. Well, I mean, no, but I would say you know, frozen food even more than a bell pepper. Because, I mean, bell pepper, you can say, okay, this is nature. Right. You know, but frozen food is like... It's frozen food, right, you know? Right. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. I... If you could assist one of the two, do, do you, would you would you assist Penn? Would you work with Penn? I, I over think I would. Well, I you know again I don't know their personalities, you know, but I probably would assist Penn. The guy that I got to talk to was Arnold Newman, mm. um, and he was a wonderful guy. He was great, you know. He just uh, well, I mean, what had happened was he had a show at the Portrait Gallery. And I covered the show, and he asked me to take a picture of his family in front of the poster of Danny Kay. You know, and so, so Arnold I, Newman walks up to you and says, "Hey." Yeah, <laughs> and so I, I, you know, shot this, and uh, I sent him some prints because I mean, I was a, I loved Arnold Newman just yeah. because the whole environmental portrait thing was just, I mean, was wonderful. So I sent him some prints, and he sent me this wonderful note back, you know, and told me, you know, I was really a good printer and so on and so forth. And, and you know, if I was ever in New York, to drop by and see him. <laughs> so I was in New York for for something. And I thought, what the heck, I'll yeah, call yeah, him yeah, up. Yeah. And he was at home. And I went to his house and we sat around and talked for like two. And then he, his studio was like right down the street. From his home? From his home. Wow. Yeah, because I mean, he'd gotten this place like... I don't know, back in the 40s or 50s or something like that. And so his studio was, and then we went down to his studio and talked, and I had brought my portfolio and everything, and he, he was nice, you know. He was, you got a portfolio review from Arnold from Newman. From Ar- Ar- Arnold Newman, right, yeah. <laughs> wow. And he was, he was very nice. Wow. Um, and, uh, but one thing I didn't do was I didn't take a picture of him. I just was while too, you were there. You didn't. No, I did. I did not take. I, and I, I sort of did kicked he myself. You too? No, no. 
And I sort of kicked myself ever since, you know, that I didn't. But I mean, I do have the picture of him that I did for the Smithsonian, yeah. which was for the Smithsonian Associates. And, and like a lot of the stuff that I shot for them, they've lost all the film. You know, so like Tom Wolfe and Norman Mailer, oh. Sir Edmund Hillary. Gone. <laughs> it's all gone. gone the time. Yeah, the only thing I have is I have, I have uh, Les Paul and uh, Jose Feliciano and the Fay Ray that I, I just posted on there. Boy, what, she had a presence about her, I bet, huh? She was gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, you, I mean, you just saw that, you I mean, you saw that, you know, a Hollywood director would look at her and go cheekbones, yeah. you know, it's like facial structure. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. Is there something about that level of photographer, the Newmans, the, the, the Pens, the Abaddons, is that, is that gone to time? Are those, are those types of photographers gone to time? Oh no, they're still out there because I, you know, I think that there's so much, um, I'm going to use the word gravitas to that work that there's almost a, there's almost a perception that there's a, on the part of some photographers that we need to continue, you know, this level mm-hmm. of, of visual interaction, you know, it needs to be maintained. It needs to be done. But it's not the bread and butter anymore. Well, it's not the bread and butter anymore because of digital. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's a photographer now. You know, anybody who's got an iPhone is a photographer. And, you know, there are so many publications and, and you know, the whole digital media thing using those images that it's just, you know, it's it's crazy. So, no, the bread and butter isn't there anymore. But the responsibility is, you know, the heritage is still there. Right. And there are still people who are doing it. And there are a few people who are getting the bread and butter out of it. But it's can, can you get, because you, you are, you know, one of the more serious printers that, I, that I've ever met. Can you get the same quality digital printing as you could analog printing? You know, it's like a, it's a funny thing know? that you should ask that question because... Um, I, I suddenly had a thought with all the stuff I've been putting out, you know, on Instagram and everything like that, that I really should put something out there says, that says prints available. Yes. But before I do that, I want to be sure that I can present them. And I'm not sure I can because I haven't done a lot of digital printing. I mean, it's all been right. for the, you know, it's all been digital. Are the tools there? Like, are are there digital equivalents of the tools that you? Well, I'm sure there are. I mean, there are there are master digital printers out there, like Jean Paul Capernegro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, You know, who work with this stuff and do gorgeous prints. You know, Um, so I'm sure it's out there. No, I haven't. You know, I did a lot of printing in the dark room, but I haven't done a lot of digital printing. I'm not sure if the tools that I have are up to the task. And now it's a whole, you know, whereas before it was exposure and, you know, I did a lot of split contrast printing and, you know, burning in and dodging and that sort of thing. Now it's ink, paper, right. printer, the file. Um, you know, there are there are all sorts of, of digital um, tools. And, and digital requirements that are different mm-hmm. from the analog situation. Would you go back and do analog printing again? Would you ever consider going back to that world? My wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, it's just one room. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's also the smells yeah, and the, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. and everything like that. Yeah. I don't know because, you know, there's, again, if I could. I really need to start doing this because, again, it's it's all you know num- numbers and zeros now, and and doesn't really exist. And what if my hard drives crash and blah blah blah? Right. So I really need to spend some time. But I really feel that there's a fantastic amount of possibility, capability in digital that is different 
from analog um, better? I don't think you can ever say better because yeah. I mean you you know is is a is a, a Da Vinci painting less than a photorealist painting? You know from now. Yeah. Do you think that's where we get kind of messed up? Is is trying to make a qualitative difference? To what came before, rather than just letting it stand on. I think it should. Yeah, I think that's where we do make a difference. Yeah. In other words, let it stand. You know, let it stand in its own time. Yeah. Um, rather than try and impose, you know, a 21st century aesthetic on, you know, the 16th century. Uh, you know, that's silly. Right. Right. You know, and and but we we have a tendency to do that with any number of subjects. You know, we've got the 16th century figured out, you know. Right. If they only had a democracy back then, you know. Even in film, like, there's a, there's a you know, we look back so fondly on film. And, and, I mean, come on, you work with some of the best digital cameras made right now. Mm -hmm. Are you really telling me that a 35 millimeter film camera is somehow better i mean that, that it just doesn't well yeah but i mean the there i mean there the clash is between technology and imagery yeah you know i mean you look at the early early like of photographs and everything or let's take eric solomon okay you know the the first like you know candid photojournalist right, right. or very early you know with a, with an erminox that has little tiny glass plates and everything like that and I mean, if you looked at them technically from the viewpoint of digital, they're crap. Right. But if you look at them from the point of view of imagery, as you know, I think I think that's as, the as shadow and light. yeah. In other words, yeah. you know, yeah. it's it's the moment. It's it's the image. It's what got caught. It's not you know that it's technically perfect. Is that what we're holding on to with digital? Do you think is is we we we've, we've kind of swung that pendulum over to well it may not be very compelling but it's sharp or we, it may not be very compelling but look at all the detail i can pull out of this image yeah well i think there's some of that i mean and it just kind of goes with the territory yeah. um you know you'll never get away from that because there will be technical photographers there will be technical there will be technical photographers in any aspect of photography right. who their their insistence is upon technical clarity technical perfection but and then you're interesting in that you walk both lines you're 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 an image guy and a composition guy in the taking of the image but then you've also been that technical perfection guy in the printing of the image yeah you've been able to exist in sort of both camps yeah, well, I mean, I mean that that went with the territory too, because I mean, you know, you were in the dark room and you were supposed to produce. Right. Well, and in some of it, I mean, again, my my interaction with photography has been pretty weird, anyway. In that, you know, you get a Brady negative in, and when's the next time you're going to handle this Brady negative? So you go after it, you know, tooth and nail. Right. Right. You know, I mean, and that's just because. You, I grew, you know, I went to art school and I was a, you know, I went, I, I hung, you know, I was with photographers who were very high in their level of craft and I'd seen really crummy prints from Brady and all of a sudden I got one of these things in my hand and I'm, what can I do with this? You know, how far can I take this? Why were they crummy though? I mean, if they had the same source material as you did, arguably, same, same glass plate, yeah? Right. Well, Why okay, I mean, yeah, so again, okay, what I'm doing now is I'm imposing. See, I'm falling into the same trap that I just talked about. Right, right, right. And in other words, the 19th century photographers are doing contact prints on 19th century paper, and that, that's a whole, you know, that's a whole thing where the, the papers responded in a particular right. way. So was it the best that they could do at the time? Yeah, it was, the, really it was the best, it was the best that they could do at the time. Yeah. And, and in some cases, you know, maybe, oh, the, you know, that uh, my judgment is bad because I'm just looking at some proof print and that the beautiful one that was displayed someplace. That's but else. having said that, modern materials uh, explored correctly were able to bring out, for me, were able to bring out things in 19th century negatives that I never saw in some 19th century prints. 
But again, what am I doing? I'm imposing a 20th century aesthetic, you know, and my own personal aesthetic on what a black and white print should look like right. on a 19th century object. So is that fair? Well, it is what it is. In other words, but how do you then recon re reconcile the stuff with Steichen? Because you you printed Steichen differently than it had been printed before, and that's that's 20th century now. So was well, was I mean, you know, again, I'm 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 me. You know, they gave me the negatives. <laughs> they gave me the negatives, and I, I made the print that I thought should right, be the right. print. You know, I mean. Uh, that was that was one of the things with the Avedon stuff was is that when they, you know, when we were working on the book, I said, you know, I'm not Richard Avedon. Right. You know, I'm going to make some prints and it's going to be out of me, you know, the tonal values and so on and so forth and fighting for, the you know, this thing and that thing. So you weren't you weren't trying to do your version of him, you were just doing you. I was doing me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I was not doing him because I couldn't do him. He's him. You know, I mean, there's a whole, again, That's that would be imposing a 19 or 2000 aesthetic on a 1960s Source imagery. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so, you know, I ain't going to go there. I mean, I told them that and they said, that's fine because we're going to be doing the Avedon images, which we have prints of, and then these would be alongside of it. Was there a dramatic difference in, in the two in terms of print quality? Or not, not necessarily... No, print interpretation. Yeah, that's... I yeah, think print, choice, print interpretation choice. is a better choice of words. Yeah. Yes. Um, he tended to... A lot of the things that... Of his prints, um, there tended to be more contrast to them. But then you lose some of that subtle... Well, you know, I was... I mean, JFK's jacket didn't look like that. You know, when you looked at the negative, right. it, it didn't look like that. But he did what he did. I did what I did. Am I right? Am I wrong? I'm not Richard Avedon. Is when, you know, that's the bottom line. Right. I'm not Richard Avedon. But you're still coming at it from serving the original image. I mean, I think you're still coming at it, both you and Avedon... We're coming at it from the same source. We want to serve the image. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to serve the image, and and again with the with the nineteenth century things, um, I wanted to serve the image. In other words, I wanted to find out. I mean, my whole shtick is tonal values. What was harder in terms of uh, process standpoint, Brady or Avedon? Oh, Brady. Because I mean, the densities were just off the charts. I mean. You know, and, and again, you know, Brady and, and the Western Survey stuff, I mean, the, the negatives, you know, were just like, well, I mean, to geek for a minute, um, a, a, a nice negative would, would have been like maybe 0 0.2 above base fog for all you people out there. You know, 0 0.2 above base fog... Uh, with a, a highlight density of maybe, I don't know, 1.3. Somebody's going to correct me on this. But in other words, you know, it's a printable range. In other words, it's not so dense that you lose the shadows. You know, so this is all the whole, uh, gets into the whole zone system thing of, you know, you go out and you meter your scene and then you process your film. You expose your film for the shadows and then you process your film for the highlights so that you end up with a negative that you know has a good range of tonal values which you can then modify if you want to but you've got everything that you want to have okay, bef yeah. before you go if you're exposing for shadows you're processing for highlights right how does that translate digitally or can it because you, you only get one shot at digitally yeah well, I don't know. I mean, different people are going to say different things. I mean, I tend to, I tend to underexpose two thirds of a stop because um, I don't want to lose the highlights. And I mean, you'll end up my, my up feeling. Shadow. Yeah, my feeling is is that digital is somewhat like transparency film, and transparency film, if you overexpose it, you were dead. You just you just blew the highlights out. You can't go back, and you can't go back. Once that negative went went either clear or black, right? 
you had no room to play. Right. But you had roll off and and early digital didn't have any of didn't have that same kind of roll off. It was either on or off, right? Uh-huh. Now yeah. we're getting to the point or have gotten to the point where at least at least there's some you know, there's a curve there instead of a cliff. Right. Right. But I mean this you know, the solution for me from the beginning with, with digital was to underexpose it, you know, two thirds of a stop. Mm. Now, like you said, earlier digital, you know, it, it just it just degraded into noise. I mean, when I think of I think of my first kind of nice camera, my G five power shot, you couldn't go above two hundred. ISO. ISO. Really? You couldn't. You couldn't go up above two hundred. It just noise. turned into garbage. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And now. I mean, even with the little Sony, um, I can do 1600 and, you know, there might be some times when I need to kind of go in and massage some of the shadows and everything, but it looks like nice Tri-X, mm-hmm. you know, um, but anyway, I mean the 19th century negatives, again, like I said, uh, a good 20th century negative, maybe 0.2 above base fog to 1.3 in the highlights, you know, somebody's going to, like I said, argue with that. Um, a uh, 19th century negative would be, the shadows would be like 0.4, and the highlights would be like 3.0. It would be like, yeah, it, it, it's, it looked like a black marble, you know, <laughs> and everything. And it was like... <laughs> On modern paper, the paper was just kind of like, you know. So what I ended up doing was split contrast printing, where I would print the shadow areas on a high contrast filter, and then I would print the the uh, the high, the highlights, the, the whites, on a low contrast filter. And that worked to a certain extent. And then I found out, I don't know how, that one of the tricks you could do was you could pre-flash the paper. You'd pre-flash the paper and all of these things that were in the highlights that you didn't see before would appear. They were all latent and they were all hidden there. And you pre-flashed the paper and, uh, you know, you could end up with this. Well, I mean, there was one that was a photograph of of a railroad bridge with all these rocks under it and everything like that. And I made some prints and everything like that. And I pre-flashed the paper and all the rocks came up with advertising written all over them, wow. which I'd never seen before. Wow. They just got lost in the highlights. They got lost in the highlights. Wow. You know, and so, you know, I pre-flashed the paper, did split contrast. So I was doing combinations of split contrast printing and, printing and pre-flashing the paper. And ending up with these, you know, these prints that were like, you know, you know it's like tonal, wow, you know. And so. how, how were those prints initially received by the powers that be, given that they were so different? Well, I mean, I, I was working at the National Archives then, so, I mean, this wasn't, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't a, a tremendously aesthetic. I mean, I was just doing this stuff, right, you know, right, for right, me, right. mostly, you know, and still not getting fired because, you know, I was working too hard on these prints, but... Um, we did have one show called American Image, and um, we were working with the Chicago Albumen Works was doing um, uh, prints for us on albumen paper. They made their own albumen paper and then made print albumen prints. And albumen paper is basically the equivalent of, again, geeking out here, uh, what was called portrait proof or printing out paper, because there's two types of papers. There's developing out paper, which is the traditional kind that everybody, you know, poly contrast, et cetera. And then there's printing out paper, which was later on was what we called portrait proof. And um, I actually worked for a guy who still had one of these things. It was a little ultraviolet thing, and you would put the negative in there with... Um, with the uh, printing out paper, and it'd go through there, and it would give a proof that you could show to the contact client right print. away. Yeah, contact yeah, yeah, print. Yeah, yeah. But the thing about printing out paper was printing out paper had a longer tonal range. It, it tended to be kind of flat, 
but that was the equivalent of albumin paper. Hmm. And somebody described it as sort of self-masking, and I don't understand all that. But anyway, you know, over the course of time, the way that you were contact printing it, you just put the contact print out in the sun, and, you know, it would make a print over a period of time. And it would self-mask, so it got that long tonal range. But modern-day paper doesn't have that. It's got, except for multi-grade papers, which have different emulsions built into them for low and high contrast. Um, modern day papers are tend to be kind of sharp. Right. You know, punchy. But that's, that's the look, right? That's, that's, well, that's the look. But in other words, you know, take that paper, combine it with a 19th century negative and you've got a train wreck, right? You know, right. you've got a train wreck. If you're going for a nice, you know, what are all the tonal possibilities from black to white, you know, that I want to go for? And in terms of like, can you ballpark what you had seen before? Like what percentage of more tonal range were you getting? Well, I would, I would say a lot of the, uh, a like lot how many of, stops more if that's easier? <clears throat> well, I don't know if I can figure that one out, but the, the 19th century prints, uh, tend to look kind of flat to a 20th century aesthetic. A 20th century aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, I'm, if I'm applying a, 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 a beautiful print of Moonrise Hernandez aesthetic to a 19th century print, I mean, that's totally unfair. Right. But um, it, it, uh, that would be what I would be talking about. In other words, we've got these rich blacks, you know, and we've got, we can see the, you know, we can see the crosses against the black and then we can see this, you know, sky with the moon and, and the, the clouds and, you know, all these just rich tones and everything like that. And, and 19th century would be, well, I mean, first of all, the films didn't respond well to blue. So the skies are washed out. Um, so they'd be kind of flat, maybe murky, but mm -hmm. but again, that's a that's a twentieth century observation on a nineteenth century object, and then you know it depends on where they are. These albumin prints we're looking at, are they platinum prints we're looking at, so on. Um, so I was going for Moonrise Hernandez from a nineteenth century negative. How close did you get? A few times. Pretty good, you know. Not always, but, you know, a few times pretty good. As I mentioned at the top, this is far from what you would call a finished episode. But I thought it was a terrific introduction into the incredible knowledge and stories that are just waiting to be recorded and shared. You can find Hugh on Instagram at Hugh Talman. That's H-U-G-H-T-A-L-M-A-N. And if you'd like to connect with me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Jeffrey Sedoris. That's J-E-F-F-E-R-Y-S-A-D-D-O-R-I-S. Or you can visit my website at JeffreySedoris.com. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you on the next one.